al-hasad, the reasons that lead to envy, the reasons that lead to envy. Uh, I believe I gave three in the uh, last lesson. Inshallah ta'ala, I'll finish with the remaining three, with the remaining three. Uh, going back to the third one, fear that someone will compete with you in a virtue that you believe is exclusive to you. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he said, uh, or Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala mentions in the Surah to Yusuf, with Qalu la Yusufu li akhi wa akhuhu ahabu ila akhina minna wa nahnu usba inna abana la fi dhalal mubin. And remember the brothers of Yusuf, they said that indeed Yusuf and his brother Binyamin are more dear to our father than us. And we are larger in number. That indeed our father has gone clearly astray to favor Yusuf and his brother over us and we're greater in number. So here the brothers of Yusuf they were envious of Yusuf and Binyamin because they thought that Yusuf and Binyamin were competing with them in something they believed was exclusive to them, which was the love of their father. This is the love of their father. And this happens even between siblings. And it's, you know, sometimes it's almost unavoidable because sometimes one child always feels like, you know, the other child gets more attention, the other child gets more love. And that may not necessarily be the case, especially the middle child. There's something that's called middle child syndrome. And the middle child always seems to believe that, you know, everyone else gets more attention than he or she does. Middle child syndrome. All right. There was a meme that I read the other day. It said the first child is the reason why rules were created in the household. And the second child, the middle child, is the reason why the rules were enforced. And the third child, the rules don't apply to them. <laughs> the youngest child, the rules don't apply to them. And it's so true. It's so true. The first child is the reason why the rules were created. And the second child is the reason why the rules were enforced. Right? And the third child, the rules don't even apply to them. Um, so true. But the brothers of Yusuf, they believe that Yusuf and his brother, Benjamin, were trying to compete with them in something that they believe was exclusive to them, and as a result of that, they were envious of Yusuf, and what took place is what took place, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in the surah. And another hadith, in a hadith, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لا تسأل المرأة طلاق أختها لتستفرغ صحفتها فإنما لها ما قدر لها. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, no woman should ask for the divorce of her co-wife. In a polygynous situation, if a man has multiple wives, a woman should not ask her husband to divorce her, his other wife so that she can make off with all of his wealth for herself. For indeed, for her is only what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for her to have. Meaning, if the man divorces the second wife just so he can only be with the first wife, she is only going to get what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed uh, the, the, the for her to have. And you'll find this in many, you know, polygynous situations where the first wife believes that him marrying another wife or an additional wife is going to infringe on the family finances. This is our money, and you marrying another woman is going to infringe on our money. So she'll make it a money issue. It's a money issue. Marrying a first wife is a money issue. Taking care of one wife is a money issue. All right? And obviously, bringing an additional member to your family uh, will definitely take a toll, but you are only going to get what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala decreed for you to have. So this is out of envy. It's not about the money. The Prophet Wasallam is informing us that this is not about the money. So when a woman says, oh, we can't afford it, or you can't do this, or we're, you know, we're going to be broke, you know, we're not going to have this, this is all out of a fit of envy that this other woman is going to come into the relationship and compete with her in something that she believes is exclusive to her. Now, albeit, there are some situations that money is definitely an issue, uh, but for the for the for the most part, it's an issue of envy, not necessarily an issue of money. Number four, from the reasons that lead to envy, is love of status and position. The love of status and position. The scholars they say that he can karajul aladi yuridu an yakuna adid al nadir fil fan min al furun wa ida ghalba alihi hubb al 
الثناء والمدح وفرح بما يمدح به فإنه إذا استمع بنذير له في أقصى من أقصار الدنيا لساءه ذلك وأحب موته وزوال تلك النعمة The scholars, they say that if a man becomes proficient in a particular field of, of knowledge or any realm in life, and he begins to enjoy the praises of people, he, be, he begins to enjoy the praises of people, and then he hears about someone else who's doing the same thing that he is doing, it can be in a far corner of the world, another remote corner of the world, but the moment he hears that someone else is doing something that he is doing, receiving the same praises that he is receiving, he immediately wants the individual to either die or be stripped of his blessing. Stripped of his blessing. Just, I'll give you an example. Let's say that a person is the mudir of a school. He's the principal of a school. I'll use this as an example. And then a teacher comes into the school and the teacher is very proactive. The, the teacher is very assertive. It might even resemble, right? the job of the leader of the principal of the school. The principal might start to feel, you know, threatened. And he has a greater position as a principal, but this particular teacher has earned the love of the children in the school. They praise him, they love him. And the principal might start to feel invalid because he was the one that used to receive the praise. And now it's this teacher that he hired that all of the children love, that all of the children praise, that all of the children, you know, extol. And so now he feels threatened. So this is the love of status and position. And we don't want that to be taken away from us. And the moment we find that someone is going to compete with us in that, we become envious of that person. This is something that happened to Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, and his sheikh, uh, Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Dhuhli. Imam Bukhari, rahimahullah ta'ala, was a young student young young individual young boy sitting in the class of his teacher muhammad ibn yahya al-buhli and while his sheikh was hafiz you know memorized many hadith his sheikh used to read from a book when he would teach when he would teach he would read from a book imam bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala would sit in the lesson and memorize every hadith he never wrote anything down he's a young boy young kid so one on one occasion his Sheikh Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Duhli, he, he, he narrated a hadith, and he's reading from a book. He said, such and such narrated on such and such, who narrated on such and such, who narrated that the Prophet sallallahu said. The young boy, Imam al-Bukhari, Muhammad ibn Ismail, he raised his hand and he said, Ya Sheikh, akhtat, you made a mistake. It is not such and such who narrated on such and such, who narrated on such and such, rather it is such and such who narrated on such and such. The Sheikh said to Imam al-Bukhari, who was a young kid at the time, he said, are you sure? Imam al-Bukhari said, yes, go back and check your book. He's quoting from his memory. Go back and check your book. So the Sheikh, after the lesson was over, took his book and went back and compared it to another book and found out that the young boy, Muhammad ibn Ismail, was right. That was strike one. In another lesson, they used to have what is called al-Mu'id. And Mu'id is someone who would sit at the lesson, memorize all of the hadith that the Shaykh would give at the lesson, and then when the lesson was over, the Shaykh would get up and leave, and the Mu'id would reiterate the lesson to those who came in late. So this was the top student. So Imam Bukhari was his Mu'id, would reiterate the lesson all from his memory. So one day, some of the students came to the Shaykh and said, can we like listen to Muhammad ibn Ismail? Can we listen to hadith from him? So he said, yeah, sure. Take, take narrations from him, listen to him. He's, he's a very good memorizer. So on one occasion, Muhammad ibn Yahya al-Duhli comes into the masjid and finds that the masjid is empty. Finds that the masjid is empty. No one is there for his lesson. And then he finds out that all of the students, instead of coming to his lesson now, then now they attend the lesson of Imam al-Bukhari. They figure, why will we sit and listen to you when he has corrected you on a number of occasions? And not on, top, not on top of that, you read from a book, he reads from his memory. We should listen and take from him. And you have already endorsed him by saying, take from him. So they didn't sit in his lessons anymore. They started taking from Imam al-Bukhari. So what happened? Envy set in. 
and he said, why are you listening to Muhammad ibn Ismail when he says, or he holds the belief that the Quran is created? And as a result of that, people left the circle of Imam al-Bukhari. They would not sit with him. They would not listen to him. They wouldn't take lessons from him. They wouldn't take knowledge from him. So much so that no matter what area he went to, no one would listen to him. No one would sit with him. No one would take knowledge from him. All because of the envy of his very own teacher. His teacher saw him competing in something or competing in a status that he believed was exclusively for him. Envy set in and he lied on Imam al-Bukhari so much so that no one would sit with Imam al-Bukhari and take knowledge from him. Here's a bahar min buhur al-ilm. Here's an a, a ocean from the oceans of knowledge and people wouldn't even sit with him and take knowledge from him simply because his own sheikh lied on him out of pure envy. Pure envy. And so this happens sometimes where a person, you know, and this is why in, you know, in the 48 laws of power, they say the rule number one is never to compete with someone, never compete with your leader. Meaning don't never outshine your leader. Do never try to overshadow your leader. Even if you are more knowledgeable than him, even if you have more understanding than him, you never try to overshadow his shine in front of the people because he's not going to take lightly to that and may possibly envy you as a result of it. Number five, just being a plain narcissist. Narcissist. Not just a narcissist, a malignant narcissist. And a malignant narcissist is an individual that sells a piece of his soul with every evil choice that they make as a child so that by the time that they reach adulthood, they are soulless individuals, soulless individuals, completely empty. And since they lack a soul, they want to make sure that others are without one as well. A malignant narcissist who thinks that it is all about them, self-aggrandizement. They don't care about anyone else. Anytime a conversation comes up, it always comes back to them. You ever talk to someone and you just start talking about some random topic and then you always end up talking about them at the end of the conversation. Well, you know, I remember that I did this. I remember that I did that. I remember back in the day I did that. This is a malignant narcissist, a person who believes that all of the world revolves around him. Every conversation, every address, every conversation, everything revolves around him. You start talking about one thing, and then you always end up talking about them at the end of the conversation because it is always about them. There is no goal or no limit to their satisfaction or pleasure. A person who is a narcissist, you can never satisfy them. The more you praise them, the more you extol them, the more you show that it's all about them, the more they want. There's no limit and there's no goal to the satisfaction or their pleasure. What they envy most is the vitality and the enthusiasm of the people that are around them. That is what they envy the most. When people have zeal, have energy, they want to steal that energy away from you. That is what they envy the most. It is not the people that they envy. It is the energy, that the energy that other people have does not revolve around him or her, and they want to take that away from you. They want to take that energy away from you. There are deficiencies Right? Um, um, their deficiencies are shown up by the desires and the vitality of other people. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam or the scholars, they say, is as if whatever Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala gave other people has been taken from the treasures that belong to him. And so when he sees other people with blessings, he goes after and tries to take that away from them because he believes that whatever blessing someone else has belongs to him, came from his treasure. That whatever blessing Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave other people, it came from his treasure, his treasure chest. And this was the tafsir that the scholars gave of a malignant narcissist. This type of individual 
it will be very difficult to cure his narcissism simply because the only thing that can cure him is seeing the blessings that others have taken away from him. That's the only thing that will cure him. To see you left with absolutely nothing, that will be the only thing that he would be satisfied with. And number six, and this will be the last one, is the love of the dunya. Love of dunya. This is why someone would become envious of another individual is purely out of his love for the dunya. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, I'lamu annama al-hayat al-dunya la'ibun wa lahun wa zinatun wa tafakhurun baynakum wa takathurun fil amwari wal awlad. And know that the life of this world is nothing but play and amusement and zina and beautification and adornment wa tafakhurun baynakum and you know, boasting and bragging about wealth and about children, that is all this dunya is about. Beautification, bragging about children, about wealth. Look at my new house, look at my new car. I got a new car, I got a new house, I just had a new child, I have X amount of children. My children are, you know, straight A students, my children are honor roll students. Mashallah, my son plays basketball, my son plays football, my son just got a scholarship. This is what it's about, bragging rights between wealth and children and beautification. This is what this dunya is about. And this is why the Prophet ﷺ instructed a man when he said, Ya Rasulullah, dullani ala amalin idha amiltuhu ahabbani Allah wa ahabbani al-nas. Qala izhad fi ma ind al-nas yuhibbuk al-nas wazhad fi ma ind wazhad fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah. A man came to the Prophet ﷺ and said, O Messenger of Allah, direct me to something that if I do it, Allah will love me and the people will love me. Allah will love me and the people will love me. The Prophet ﷺ said, Izhad fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah. Stay away from the dunya and Allah will love you. Stay away from the dunya and Allah will love you. Wazhad fi ma inda nas yuhibbuk nas. And stay away from competing with people and things that are important to them and the people will love you. Once someone knows that you are not a threat to them, they will open up to you. They feel comfortable with you because they don't feel threatened by you. But the moment you come and they feel threatened, they automatically make you an enemy. Automatically. You ever start a new job and you go to your job wanting to do the best that you can possibly do, not realizing that there's somebody who's been on their job for 10 years, the same job, and can't do the job as half as good as you do and you've only been on the job for a week or two. And automatically, the moment he sees you walk through the door, he automatically feels threatened by you. You come in, first two, three weeks, you get a promotion, you're, you're employee of the month, and this guy has been on the job for 20 years. He eats, sleep, and drink his job, and still can't do in 10 years what you have managed to do in a month. Immediately, he makes you an enemy. Why? Because you have competed with something that he feels is dear to him. And albeit, that doesn't mean that we should, you know, um, always take the lower end of the stick simply because we don't want to upset or ruffle other people's feathers. But the Prophet ﷺ is telling you that if you compete with people and things that they consider dear to them, they're going to hate you. They're going to hate you for it. This may even happen between a father and a son. A father may not be doing well as a father. Financially, can't seem to get on board, you know, uh, in terms of running the household, can't seem to have it all together. The son may grow up, go to college, have a nice job, manage his money properly, get married, structure his family, and the father may become envious of his own son. Wallahi, I've seen it. I've seen it with my own eyes. Simply because the son was able, was, was managed to pull off being a better father, a better caretaker, a better husband than his own father has. And as a result of that, he envies you for it. He envies you for it. So the Prophet وسلم, he told the man, Izhad fi dunya yuhibbuk Allah. Stay away from the dunya. Izhad fi dunya. Take only from the dunya what you need, and that's it. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will love you. Was had fi ma'inda nas yuhibbuk nas And stay away from the things that people love, and the people will love you. You ever notice that you can be cool with someone, you can be okay with someone, and the moment you ask to borrow money from them, you are now an enemy. They, even if they loan you the money, their demeanor, their character with you changes. 
simply because you have competed with them in something that they consider dear. Everyone loves money. And there are very few of us who give unrestrictedly without any, without any attachment. We give, but we want to hold you emotionally, attack, uh, emotionally hostage. We want to remind you of what we gave to you. We want to, you know, use you now for certain things because you are indebted to me. You owe me. I gave you X, Y, Z. We want to make small reminders. And if you make a small reminder of something that you have done for someone, brothers and sisters, you have, that is the quickest way to destroy your good deed. The quickest way to destroy your good deed is to do something for someone and then turn around and remind them of it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the only one that is allowed to do that. One of Allah's names is, is Al-Mannan. Al-Mannan. Allah is the one that benefits his creation. We are the recipients of the benefit. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can remind us of the good that he has done for us as much as he wants. He is Rabbul Alameen. He is al razak He is the provider. He is Al-Wahhab, the giver. He is Al-Mu'ti, the one who gives... He is the bestower, and he has every right and manan to remind you about the good that he has done for you. Didn't we find you as an orphan and we gave you shelter? And we found you astray and we gave you guidance. And we found you asking people and we sufficed you. He reminded the Prophet of all of the blessings that he gave you. All the blessings that he gave him, simply because he is al manan he is the only one that is allowed to do that. As for us as creation, we are only facilitating to other people what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has already decreed for them to have. So if someone comes to you to borrow money and you loan them money, you are not the beneficiary. He is, he, you are not the beneficiary. You are just the facilitator of the benefit that Allah had already decreed for the person to have. That's it. But when you start reminding people about what you've done for them, then you have, that is the quickest way to destroy your blessing. So, سار في يوم صائب فاستظل تحت الشجرة ساعة من نهار ثم راح وتركها. The Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم putting this dunya in perspective. Umar رضي الله تعالى عنه he entered into the house of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم and he was laying down on the floor on top of some date palm leaves. He put some leaves on the floor and he lay down on top of the leaves. When Umar entered. The leaves had left an imprint on the side of the face of the Prophet Sallallahu So you know how a person lays on a pillow or lays on something hard, and then when he gets up, you can see the imprint of it on the person's face or on the person's body part. So the leaves had left an imprint on the face and on the side of the Prophet Sallallahu Umar seeing this, he said, Oh, Messenger of Allah, why don't we go get you a bed? <laughs> you know, why don't, you, why don't we go get you a firash? Why don't we go get you a nice, you know, blanket, a nice, you know, Quote the lay down he lay down. The Prophet Sallallahu looked up at Umar and he said, Mali woman, more mali dunya. He said, Umar, what do I have to do with this dunya? What do I have to do with this dunya, man? He said, Wamali well, wa dunya in the karakit. He said, My example and the example of this dunya is like a traveler who travels for a particular period of time. And he settles down by a tree just to relax for a particular moment and get up and continue the rest of his journey. I'm not here forever. This is a temporary stopping place. This is not my life. This is not my address. Your address is not 1221 Washington Street. Your address is Jannah. That's your address. This is a temporary stopping place. This is only the third stage in your life. You still got two more stages to go. You have the barzakh, you have the grave, and then you have Yom al You. This is just a temporary stopping place. You have to put it in perspective. Omar, that is not important to me. 
having a bed to lay on a comfortable mat, that's not important to me. I'm only here for a particular period of time. You hear people say all the time, I didn't get enough sleep. I don't sleep enough. Al-Raha fi dunya Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, La astarih hatta adha rijlay fil jannah. Umar, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he said, there's no raha. There is no relaxation for me until both of my feet are in paradise. Only then can I relax. This dunya is shugul. It's about work. It's about amal. It's about work, action. This is not relax. This is not the time to relax. This is the time to put in work. During Ramadan, the last 10 days of Ramadan, is, is, it's really a struggle, that uphill battle. And you, you get very little sleep. You know, sometimes you might go a whole day without even showering because you're fasting, you're sleeping, you're reading Quran, you're memorizing. And then on the day of the Eid, you come out like brand new money. <laughs> you know, you got all new clothes, you didn't shower, you know, you know, went and got a haircut and you feel good. You see everybody. But during the last 10 nights of Ramadan, that's the time for work. That's the time to put in work. The Prophet Wasallam, you know, used to sleep very little in the last 10 nights of Ramadan. And here we are in the, you know, first 10 days of Dhuhijjah, the most beloved days to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al-amal al fihi, that there's no good deeds done in any other day that are more beloved to Allah than the good deeds that are done in these first 10 days of Dhuhijjah. And bi idhnillahi ta'ala, Wednesday will be the day of Arafah, the day that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala frees more people from the hellfire than any other day on the calendar. And that is a recommended day of fasting, and we should fast. We should fast the whole nine days of Dhuhijjah if we have the ability to do so. All right, but if you can't, then at least the day of Arafah, which will be Wednesday, inshallah ta'ala, two days from now. Wahada wa sallallahu ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam at tasliman kithira wa subhanaka rabbika rabbil izzati amma yasifun wa salamun ala al-mursaleen wa alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.